straight into the first session, which will be moderated by Eric Sigia from the Rockefeller University. Eric, please take it away. Hi, thank you. Uh, well, thanks all for coming. Uh, those of you who have been fortunate to attend an in-person KITP meeting uh, will recall the, uh, the luxury of an hour-long plus talk with interruptions along the way. Uh, although we can't uh, replicate that form uh, remotely, uh, we can, however, uh, use the technology to draw in more people and uh, organize things more on the spur of the moment as the organizers have done. Um, so, and hopefully uh, when things resume to normal, many of you will uh, participate uh, in person at a, K at a KITP program. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Berna Stozen, uh, who began her education in Turkey and uh, is a member of the Turkish diaspora who have done so much to uh, enrich American uh, academic life. Uh, um, she completed her degree in, in Cambridge uh, and uh, where she did an experiment which um, the experts would have told her uh, 12 ways why it wouldn't work, but in fact it worked and uh, gave very interesting results that you will now tell us about. But please take over and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much. So let me share my... Uh, yes, um, hello everyone and thanks Eric for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this meeting and present my work. Thanks for um, everyone who registered and thanks to organizers for the invitation and the opportunity. And I'm, of course, looking forward to hear some great talks over the next couple of days. So as um, Eric introduced, um, uh, I started my education in Turkey and then I moved to Cambridge and now I'm, I'm in, in the States and I'm, I'm, I'm just opening my lab in um, at the School of Medicine. Um, and the lab is in its very early days. Uh, today, instead, I will be presenting some of my postdoctoral work in uh, Magdalena Zarnitschka Goetz lab, which we did in the University of Cambridge. Um, Magda's lab, uh, maybe most of you, some of you are familiar, maybe not, uh, her lab is interested in early mammalian development from the time of fertilization to the point um, at which the first body axes are formed during gastrulation. So from this direction, uh, my talk will be discussing how we use stem cells to model the formation of the first body axis within, uh, within three-dimensional platforms. So for those that are not so familiar with the early stages of development, this illustration highlights the first week after fertilization in mouse, uh, which would be two weeks in human. During this time, the fertilized egg undergoes a series of uh, cleavage divisions, resulting in the formation of a hollow ball of cells, which is called the blastocyst. By this point, the embryo, namely blastocyst, comprises um, three fate-restricted lineages, uh, it, the embryonic epiblast, which, uh, which positioned inside, and surrounding extraembryonic lineages, trophy ectoderm and primitive endoderm. The blastocyst is capable of implanting into the maternal tissues, and with implantation, these early lineages undergo a dynamic transformation, and um, embryonic morphology overall drastically changes. So these changes, which we call pre to post remodeling, lead to the formation of cylindrical post-implantation structure in mouse development. So the original uniform cluster of cells within the early embryo uh, transformed into highly organized layers of tissues by these uh, remodeling steps. Soon after this remodeling, the embryonic radial symmetry becomes broken to establish body axis at the onset of gastrulation, which I will be explaining these events more um, later in my talk. So how the early embryo can undertake this complex transformation with such fidelity is still not very well understood. Um, this is because it is difficult to decouple the cellular movements and molecular events as they occur in vivo, and the possibilities to perform in vivo manipulations are fairly limited. Compared to other model organisms, um, conducting genetic experiments on mammalians is often time consuming uh, and also complicated by the limited accessibility of embryos after implantation at this stage. Uh, these difficulties in studying early development in vivo have prompted efforts to model um, embryogenesis in vitro using stem cell lines, which are the building blocks of the embryo and more amenable and tractable for experimentation. 
uh, there has been enormous progress in using cell culture systems to model embryonic development, and these model systems have become very popular over the recent several years. Um, I will summarize these model systems a little bit. Um, each model system looks at different aspects of early embryogenesis, and all of them show some level of spontaneous self-organization and patterning. The principle differs between each model system. Uh, some systems use ES cells, embryonic stem cells, in isolation on their own, which can be called non-integrated stem cell models. And these systems mostly focus on uh, gastrulation and post-gastrulation events. Pluripotent um, embryonic stem cells can self-organize to form germ layer rings when confined to two-dimensional micropatterns, or they can be used to generate um, three-dimensional aggregates to mimic axis patterning in embryoid bodies. They can also be used to generate gastroloids after a strategically timed wind pulse, which induce axial elongation and mimics post-gastrulation. These systems, these um, uh, ES cell-based models are becoming gradually becoming more advanced, as we see in one of the most recent studies, which mimics somatogenesis in trunk-like structures. A different approach um, has been to combine embryonic stem cells with extra embryonic stem cells in an attempt to more closely mimic the natural developing embryo in vivo, which can be considered as integrated stem cell models. Uh, we and the Nicolas Sivron lab, we were able to show self-assembly and self-organization of multiple stem cell types in three-dimensional platforms, and this has helped to understand dynamic interaction between um, early embryonic between the early embryonic lineages. Our systems, ET and ETX embryos, which I will uh, which will be the main uh, focus of this talk, mimic early post-implantation and axis patterning, while the blastoid system by the Sivron lab models uh, pre-implantation blastoid stage. In addition, I should mention, several laboratories have derived extended potential stem cells that are report to be able to, uh, reported to be able to generate extra embryonic tissues themselves because they have an extended potential beyond pluripotent cells. In addition to the blastoid model by the Rivron lab, uh, we have, in parallel with Juan Carlos Belmonte's lab, showed that expanded potential cells can be used to generate blastoids. However, today um, I won't be discussing our blastoid model in this talk. Um, these examples that I just mentioned, I just summarized, are mainly using mouse stem cells to model mouse embryogenesis. Uh, however, more recently, several groups, including Eric Sigia's lab, have now begun to make excellent progress uh, using human stem cells to mimic human embryogenesis. Again, all of these models are unique and useful in their own way, but they are not the perfect replicates of natural embryos with full developmental capacity, of course. Uh, stem cell-based embryos are relatively simple systems, lacking some features, yet effectively mimicking specific subsets of events in the embryo. Um, these model systems provide new ways to investigate cell patterning and morphogenetic events in space and time in vitro. And what's really beneficial is that we can take a bottom-up approach to study poorly understood developmental events. One of the developmental events um, we were interested in when I was in the lab of Professor Magdalena zanishka Goetz at the University of Cambridge was early post-implantation morphogenesis and symmetry breaking. With the advances in stem cell biology, we developed in vitro platforms that com combine, as I mentioned, embryonic and extra embryonic stem cells. Um, although some models of early development exist using ES cells alone, no such models existed to study the specific time points um, uh, and the sequential events at pregastrulation that lead to symmetry breaking. So our purpose was to generate an integrated stem cell model to recapitulate these early events in vitro. And to do so, we took all three stem cell types from the blastocyst, ES, TS, and Zen cells, and we recombined them to form 3D mouse embryo models. Uh, the purpose is, of course, not just to imitate nature, but to understand how uh, various cells and tissues interact to promote a robust outcome. In our design, uh, we see that single cell suspensions in a medium supporting the proliferation of all these three cell types. And at the optimized cell density, which is um, about 30 cells in total, all three cells together, uh, these cell types show spontaneous self-organization and form multicellular aggregates. 
for the aggregation purpose, uh, we used inverted pyramidal microvals. Um, the illustration is here, uh, which we found essential for the proper aggregation when starting with such small number of cells. Um, here's a representative ETX structure, uh, just to introduce them four days after aggregation. Um, and importantly, these um, stem cells self-assemble and sort into the appropriate configuration. The cells organize such that the pluripotent ES cells in red here and extraembryonic TS cells in blue uh, cluster next to each other. And the positioning of these compartments defines the first axis in the structure, proximal and distal. Both these compartments become enveloped by another extraembryonic layer formed by Zen stem cells. And this morphology um, we know mirrors exactly that of natural uh, post-implantation mouse embryo. Uh, somehow I, I had a movie here, but it doesn't work. Of course, typical, sorry about that, but this was supposed to be showing how they develop in culture. Um, as mentioned, embryogenesis is special temporal process with certain milestones. And one of these milestones occur in pregastrulation window as indicated here. Morphological transformations during pregastula development is set the stage for breaking embryo symmetry at the onset of gastrulation. This occurs as mesoderm starts to become specified at the posterior, as indicated in yellow in this illustration. So what happens in the first few days of ETX embryo assembly? As I just showed, we have the correct configuration of cells along the proximal distal axis, but does this configuration facilitate the correct cellular, biochemical, and molecular interactions between the stem cell compartments? Indeed, um, they follow some spe steps of uh, pregastula patterning in culture. This is a representative ETX structure stained with laminin in white, which shows the uh, Zen layer formed basal membrane from the early stages of aggregation as the visceral endoderm does in vitro, in vivo. This basal membrane established by Zen cells is essential for acquiring the uh, pregastula morphogenesis in these structures as it provides polarization signals which are necessary for luminogenesis. These are the snapshots of ETXs at different time points in culture where we can see a central cavity opens in, uh, in the ES compartment in early stage structures, um, as you can see more clearly and in zoom images at the bottom. Uh, this cavity, this central cavity over time expands to span the whole cylindrical structure, which is similar of promnotic cavity uh, of natural post, post gastrula embryos. So this shows, importantly, cells appear to be functioning as they do in vivo. And the different cell types are communicating each other to guide the progressive change in morphology. And followed by this cavity unification, uh, it's about like five days after in culture, we observed uh, some changes in cellular polarity within the distinct domain of the pluripotent ES compartment. So this polarity change represents early anterior posterior patterning events, and this is the first sign of symmetry breaking. Um, looking at the cellular polarity in more detail, uh, cells, this is just focusing on embryonic compartment in an ETX embryo, uh, cells in the presumptive anterior region maintain an intact organized epithelium, whereas the cells in the presumptive posterior region lose this apico-basal polarity, which indicates epithelial to mesenchymal transition. This is analyzed through the loss of um, apical positioning uh, of Goji marker GM130 in red staining and also confirmed in the natural gastro laws uh, along the bottom. Um, as further confirmation, we tracked cell movements during this patterning. This is an ETX embryo generated from GFP membrane reporter ES cells with white type TS and Zen cells. With time-lapse tracking, we observed cell movements and change in polarity in, within the embryonic compartment. An example cell undergoing apical construction is shown here, we can see change from a columnar to bottle shape, which finally becomes rounded as it acquires um, the mesenchymal shape. Um, I will move on what these uh, cellular, these changes at cellular level, what they mean, but perhaps before I move on, I can pause here if there are any questions so far with the methodology um, or anything else.
Anyone raising their hand? Um, Ahmad, uh, let me. Yes, um, hello. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding the very earlier stage of this development. Uh, I was wondering if they, this is a one component development that develops to more than one component. I mean, I'm talking about those stem cells at the very earliest stage, or it's more than one component that we are not seeing. Um, you mean by component? Can you a little bit explain, like, what do you mean by one? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm asking if there is any other player than the cells themselves in that very earliest stage that is making them to reshape, or no? It's their own interactions that makes them reshape? What do you think? Um, well, I mean, cells definitely have, have self-organization uh, capacity because if we take, there are some maternal interactions for sure uh, and, and some signals coming from endometrium or even the physical constraints, of course, it's helping, it's possibly helping to shape the embryo. Um, however, if you isolate embryos and if you put them in culture without any maternal tissues, they still self-organize. So there is definitely a great capacity of self-organization and the uh, um, signaling interactions between different cell types are definitely shaping embryo. However, like I will mention that uh, by the end of my talk, um, of course, there's a point where uh, endometrium and maternal tissues become quite crucial. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, uh, plunge onward. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, so far I showed how we generated the ETX embryos and how at the cellular level we see uh, they start to become patterning. But all of these changes at the cellular level at a distinct domain indicates symmetry breaking for, uh, for embryonic patterning at the onset of gastrulation. But of course, behind this process, the cellular process, uh, there are some biochemical and molecular interactions necessary for axial establishment. Biochemical interactions governing axial establishment in the early mouse embryo um, are fairly well characterized in vivo. Uh, in the mouse, um, we know that the extra embryonic tissues, uh, visceral endoderm and extra embryonic ectoderm, they induce um, mesoderm formation, thus symmetry breaking in the epibulas through controlling three important signaling gradients, nodal, wind, and BMP. Uh, the source of these signaling gradients is known to be the anterior visceral endoderm. In short, we you know uh, it's AVE, shown yellow in this illustration. And this um, AVE uh, signaling center, it, it functions as a signaling center overlaying the anterior epibulas. And the inhibitors such as DKK1, Lefty1, and Cyberus1, um, they are expressed from AVE. Uh, they confine wind PMP and nodal signals to the posterior of the uh, embryo. As a result, formation of mesoderm marks the symmetry breaking. Going back to our in vitro system, uh, here is an image shows the broken symmetry in an ETX embryo on the left. Uh, asymmetric Mercury expression in green reveals the mesoderm domain restricted to the one side of the structure. Again, this mirrors similar events in the natural gastrula, which is shown on the right. And also, this marks the second body axis formation within these structures. So to remind, as mentioned before, the first axis is proximal axis, uh, marked by the position of ES and TS cells. In the case of the embryo, this is epiblast and extra embryonic endoderm, uh, sorry, extra embryonic ectoderm. Uh, second axis is the anterior, posterior, by the formation of mesodermal domain uh, on one side. So there are some crucial questions at this point. How do stem cell embryos break the symmetry and gain axis specification? Uh, do they establish morphogen gradients that are known to be essential for axis patterning? And if so, how are these uh, gradients established? And the extra embryonic cells responsible for providing localized signals? Or alternatively, um, are these structures undertaking spontaneous symmetry breaking without extra embryonic guided signaling uh, interactions. 
So all of these questions are very important and to provide answers to these questions, we firstly analyzed nodal signaling activity in ETX embryos. We generated structures using nodal YFB reporter ES cells with wild type extra embryonic cells. So the top uh, picture here is from uh, is after four days in culture. And nodal first shows uniform expression throughout the ES compartment uh, after four days in culture. Later on, these signals become symmetric and higher on the presumptive posterior side at day five. So the intensity profiles for this nodal via fluorescence from each stage are here, confirming the observations made. And importantly, this occurs highly efficiently in this 3D system with more than 80% of structures show patterning in nodal signaling, which I think is quite, um, quite impressive. But again, uh, what establishes these local, localized signals in, in this in vitro system? So the main question here is that are localized signals guided by extra embryonic cells present in this platform? And specifically, do ETX embryos possess an ABE organizer? Uh, to understand this, we assess the expression of lactivon, which is a secreted protein, functions as a nodal antagonist, and we found some ETX embryos, some ETX embryos show asymmetric lactivon expression in Zen layer. Uh, this is one striking example where a subset of uh, Zen cells show regionalized lactivon expression. In another example here, we see Bracuri expressing posterior domain opposite the left one expressing possible AVE-like domain. So this result suggests that um, each cell in a domain senses and responds to its position along the morphogen gradient. And these positional information cues establishes the symmetry breaking and pattern formation in the structure. Well, um, although this matches with our classical knowledge from in vivo, there is something uh, important to mention which is that AVE-like domain and regionalized inhibitor expression is detected only in a small subset of ETX structures. Uh, when we did our analysis, we found the majority of ETX embryos do not express any sorts of AVE-associated markers in the Zen layer, and if we don't have AVE, of course, this suggests alternative mechanisms may play role. Um, there are, again, there are twice as many ETX embryos with asymmetric morphogen patterning, and symmetry breaking than those, um, than those in an AV-like domain. And more strikingly, um, I haven't given any uh, much attention to our previous study, but our uh, work, uh, our previous model, which does not include Zen cells, uh, when these model embryos are generated only embryonic and trophoblast stem cells, um, they, and, and they don't have AV, of course, because they don't have endoderm, these structures also break symmetry and show asymmetric uh, winter expression on one side, suggesting that AVE produced inhibitors do not necessarily drive embryonic uh, symmetry breaking, at least in this context. So we are not exactly sure what is driving this, but symmetry breaking may potentially be explained by uh, staff organization properties of the embryonic cells itself which is still linked to, but distinct from um, extra embryonic positional information. So if cells are producing their own activators and inhibitors, this symmetry breaking could occur as a result of self-organized patterning, namely, the, namely uh, by the reaction diffusion circuit. As interesting as it is, whether the reaction diffusion circuit is operational in ETX or ET embryo system, we don't yet know. Um, we haven't investigated this option, um, and this is subject to further investigation. So these are interesting results, um, and we also further validated the um, uh, extent of this axis patterning by analyzing the global uh, molecular signature. Uh, here, uh, we first built ETX embryos from mesoderm reported ES cells. As this illustration shows, we first dissected away TS compartment and then isolated um, non-fluorescent prospective anterior domain and fluorescent positive prospective posterior domain for RNA sequencing. Uh, most differentially expressed genes were correctly associated with anterior and posterior gene signature that we know from a natural embryo, and this was further confirmed with gene ontology analysis. 
We then compared these gene expression patterns in anterior and posterior domains to the ones from natural embryos. Um, for this, we used a method developed in Nai Haying's laboratory in Shanghai. Uh, Nai Ha's group determined the uh, special transcriptome from different gastrostomal stages of the mouse epiblast, and in their methodology, the special pattern of gene expressions within each subdomain of epiblast are presented in the corn plot. So what we did is, uh, what we did is that uh, we mapped the global gene expression within GFP negative and GFP positive domains of ETX embryo against each subdomain of three different gastrular stages. Um, so we, we did that in, with individual ETX embryos, and this confirmed the correlation of gene expression at the global level, which strongly matches with posterior and anterior gene signatures. Um, and the stage uh, where ETX embryos can reach could be from early to uh, late gastrular stage, late three gastrular embryo. So going back to this illustration again, um, so the main principle of gastrulation is to generate three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Uh, and each germ layer give rise to progenitors of all major organs later on. Uh, so far, I showed you the formation of anterior posterior by the specification of uh, mesoderm in ETX system. But what about the third germ layer, the embryonic endoderm formation, which we know, which we know as a definitive endoderm? So can this system also recapitulate definitive endoderm germ layer formation? Um, so the definitive endoderm formation is nicely shown in natural gastrulas previously by Katatron-Tonakis lab. Uh, the process occurs as in vivo development progresses. They showed that the original GFV expressing layer gradually replaced by the uh, by cells aggressing from the epiblast, and they make definitive endoderm. So we took the similar approach, and we built ETX embryos with GFP reporters then cells. Uh, these images are looking from the surface uh, view. Um, so we were able to observe over time in culture, GFP negative areas appear in the continuous layer of GFP positive then cells, and egressing cells um, and egressing cells from the ES-drived compartment from inside, they were accommodated here. Uh, and importantly, this happens specifically in the embryonic compartment. These um, lines are showing embryonic extraembryonic boundary, and we see this GFP negative areas only appear in, appear in the embryonic uh, part, embryonic portion of the structure, and the cells coming from uh, uh, embryonic domain replaces the Zan layers. Uh, so this indicates the generation of the third germ layer, which is definitive end of them. Um, so to summarize, with this system, several developmental milestones can be recapitulated in vitro. This system first shows self-assembly and self-organization of the different, different stem cell types. Upon self-assembly and self-organization, structures undergo pregastrular morphogenesis. This includes tissue separation, cell polarization and proamniotic light cavity formation. And they are able to develop to recapitulate aspects of um, early to mid gastrular patterning. And this indicates symmetry breaking axis formation and germ layer patterning. So there are still notable limitations to overcome. This applies to all stem cell based embryo models. First of all, it is important to improve the efficiency uh, of these in vitro systems. Related to ETXs specifically, the current methodology is negatively complex. Aggregation design relies on interaction of multiple stem cells in the right number and ratio, which uh, of course causes variability. So this technical challenge um, has yet to be overcome and perhaps it is demanding future innovative uh, microengineering approaches. Um, anteriorization happens, but it's not robust in this system. This limits the ability of um, for example, neuronal tissue formation, which we don't see. Uh, although posteriorization is much more robust, EMT events, epithelial to mesen chymal transition events, are quite limited. There are certainly EMT movements, but full primitive streak formation, uh, primitive streak formation is lacking. Another point is that um, they are developing, these structures are developing in suspension, in, in vitro 
which is nothing like the constraints of maternal environment. Biomechanical features of stem cell aggregate are highly different than in vivo. And of course, this perhaps limits the lineage dif uh, differentiation at later stages, um, and perhaps overall, uh, their overall developmental capacity is also limited. So despite these limitations, there are still some open questions that can potentially be addressed using this system. Uh, the first thing is, as I briefly touched upon, alternative contributing mechanisms to access patterning, such as self-organized symmetry breaking or differential receptor positioning, is yet to be characterized in the systems. Uh, studies mostly focus on pluripotent cells. All of these um, in vitro stem cell-based embryo models mostly focus on pluripotent cells because they are uh, they give rise to the germ layers, but what is the self-organization potential of the extra embryonic lineages? This is highly understudied. Um, and future investment into studies of the biophysical mechanisms of tissues and coupling these mechanisms to bio biochemical properties should enable uh, the multiple systems of regulation in embryonic development. So altogether, um, while an integrative view remains far from complete, these emerging tools provide potential for bringing the building blocks together to better understand uh, early development. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning slides, this work has been done in Zanichka Gold's lab as a part of uh, my postdoctoral work, and I hugely thank Magda uh, for supporting this project. Also, huge thanks to my colleagues whose work made this story possible and who are now following up different aspects in the ETX uh, system to answer different questions. Um, my lab is now based in Yale, Department of Genetics, and welcoming trainees at various levels. We are now trying to utilize these models, as well as the natural embryo itself, to understand developmental programming and origin of disease. Um, if you are interested in this kind of uh, research, and if, if you would like to apply for a PhD and postdoc position, please get in touch. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I will be happy to answer your questions.